السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه والتابعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala We send blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam his entire household, all his companions, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless them all and may every single one of us be blessed. Ameen. My brothers and sisters in Islam, we are going through reasons of revelations of verses of the Quran. And this evening I will commence with a beautiful verse of the Quran. Every one of us has needs. Every one of us makes dua or supplicates to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ask yourself for a moment, if I were to ask you to pray right now for your needs, what would you say? What type of a dua would you make? Would you say, oh Allah, grant me good health, grant me prosperity, grant me wealth, grant me a good job, grant me a spouse, grant me a beautiful home and grant me a lovely motor vehicle and grant me the latest in terms of everything and the beautiful sense and so on and make me rich and wealthy? O oh Allah, grant me children who will be good and grant me, you know, pretty and handsome kids and make me from amongst those who look so gorgeous and so on. I think a lot of us would actually make those du'as. Is it wrong? The answer is it's not wrong, but we are forgetting something very big, very, very big. Let's listen to what happens. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes mention of two categories of people that used to make dua when they went for hajj, when they made dua. The narration of Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu, which is made mention of in Tafsir al-Tabari, he says there were people from amongst the Bedouin Arabs who used to come for hajj. And they used to pray, Rabbana atina fi dunya. Oh Allah, grant us goodness in this world. And it stopped there. So Allah says, وَمَا لَهُ فِي الْآخِرَةِ مِنْ خَلَاقَ he achieves nothing when it comes to the hereafter. Absolutely nothing. The reason is because he asked only for the dunya, so he got only the dunya. There is no portion for him in the hereafter. But the true believers, they ask Allah goodness in the dunya. And on top of that, they continue to ask Allah goodness in the hereafter as well. وَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ يَقُولُ رَبَّنَا آتِنَا فِي الدُّنْيَا حَسَنَةً وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ حَسَنَةً وَقِنَا عَذَابَ النَّارِ أُولَئِكَ لَهُمْ نَصِيبٌ مِّمَّا كَسَبُوا وَاللَّهُ سَرِيعُ الْحِسَابِ they are those, those who believe, they call out to Allah saying, Oh Allah, grant us goodness in this world, grant us goodness in the hereafter, and protect us from the punishment of the fire. Allah says, those are the ones who will achieve what they've earned. They will have a portion for what they've earned. And Allah is indeed very quick in taking account. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us all. What I learn from this and what we expect everyone to learn from this is, it's good to ask Allah. It's good to ask Allah for goodness of this world. But don't stop there. If you're a believer, what is more important, even if you've lost out in this world, even if you did not get what you wanted in this world, for as long as you got the akhirah, for as long as you got jannah, trust me, that is the biggest thing you could ever have. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us all from jahannam and may He grant us all Jannah. Amen. A beautiful story of a companion known as Suhaib ibn Sinan al-Rumi. He was a Roman, he was enslaved because he was a foreigner, and he was made slave in Mecca to Mukarrama and so on. And there came a time when he earned something, and mashallah, he was bought off and freed. And then he wanted to make the hijrah to Medina Munawwara in order to join Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The narration made mention of in Tafsir al-Tabari, Sa'id ibn al-Musayyib speaks about it. O oh, al-Musayyib. And if you look at this narration, he says, this man, Suhaib ibn Sinan al-Rumi, he had saved up quite a bit of money. 
And when he was going out for the hijrah, he decided to leave all that money in a specific place, hiding it in Mecca. And he went singularly, alone taking a little bit of weaponry in case someone harmed him. As you know, the people of Mecca did not want people to make hijrah. They wanted to keep them back. And they used to persecute them. So what happened is, this man, as he was leaving Mecca, in order to get to Medina Munawwara, a group of the disbelievers surrounded him. They wanted to attack him. So he told them, hey, as you know, I have archery or I have weaponry with me. I'm an archer, the best of the archers you can have. All the arrows I have, I will ensure that I squarely get them on every one of you and you will be punished and penalized. And if everything is over, here is my sword. I'm going to fight you guys. Don't stop me from going to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam from making the hijrah to Medina Munawwara. Don't stop me. And if you want, I can tell you something, he says to them. What is it? I've left my wealth in Mecca to Mukarramah. I will show you exactly where it is. If you go, you can collect all of it, but let me go. So he was trying to avoid the fight. And he was trying to avoid the battle. In return for what? For them leaving him to go to Medina Munawwara and him giving them everything he had ever saved. Think about it in your lives. How much have you saved? A few rands? Well, the rand is dropping as we speak. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. What have you saved? It's being taken away from you in terms of value, even though the figures are increasing. Look at how things are turning. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect this nation. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all goodness. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala improve the economy for one and all. Ameen. So my brothers and sisters, imagine if someone were to tell you, all your belongings, all your savings, bring them here and I won't slap you. I'd rather take that slap. Allahu Akbar. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. May Allah grant us goodness. I think maybe what I've saved is not that much. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us all and grant us the savings of the akhirah. So my brothers and sisters, something interesting. Allah makes mention of this verse number 207 of Surah Al-Baqarah. وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَشْرِي نَفْسَهُ ابْتِغَاءَ مَرْضَاتِ اللَّهِ وَاللَّهُ رَؤُوفٌ بِالْعِبَادِ from amongst the people is he who has sold himself in order to earn the pleasure and the happiness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is indeed very kind to his slaves. Amazing. He sold himself. He sold in what sense? Meaning he gave everything, all the dunya, wealth, the wealth, the material items he had in order to earn the pleasure of Allah. He desperately wanted to get to the most beloved Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for the sake of Allah, to protect his deen. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us an understanding. <coughs> then we have something else that is very interesting in the Quran. And this is in Surah Al-Baqarah. Allah speaks of divorce. And you and I know that we know very little about divorce and the rules of divorce. The reason is, when do we get to hear about it? If there is a wedding, marriage, they call some imam to speak. What is he going to speak on? He's going to speak on nikah. Have you ever heard a nikah being officiated and the imam gets up and speaks about talaq? He speaks about divorce? They probably pelt him out of the masjid. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala safeguard us. But I think it is important when you have a gun to know how to use it. You need to know what the trigger is all about. Because you might just pull it without knowing what you've done. There is no joking when it comes to divorce. There is no playing when it comes to divorce. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala safeguard us. You don't use those words not even by mistake. So at the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, according to a narration which appears in Sunan al-Tirmidhi narrated by Aisha radiallahu anha, she says, there were men who used to divorce their wives a hundred times and get them back because they knew where are they going to go. So divorce once, go. Then after a while, okay, I take you back. Divorce again, go. Okay, I take you back. And so on 100 times, meaning so many times. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes mention of this because there was a man. There was a man who had come to or who had divorced a certain woman and the complaint of this woman came to Aisha radiallahu anha and she reported it to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to say this woman is complaining that look at these men. They are divorcing as they will and then they're remarrying and we have no option because we've got kids from them and so on. 
to go back. And for us, it was the best option. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said or revealed verse number 229. Divorce is only twice. That's it. First time, you have an option of getting back. Second time, you have an option of getting back. Third time, everything is over. You cannot play a game with a female. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala safeguard us. You issue one talaq, you have the right to try and reconcile. In fact, you should. And you should try and make amends and make things work. And that is an act of worship. Allah says, no matter how much you are disputing, لا تدري لعل الله يحدث بعد ذلك أمرا. How do you know? You've got no clue. Perhaps Allah might create something in terms of solution to the problem after that. Allah can create a solution. Even though you might have not been seeing eye to eye, something can happen that can make you learn to love one another once again. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us love in our own homes. And may we seize this opportunity to resolve any marital dispute and discord that we may be suffering within our own homes. Ameen. It's a month of Ramadan and we're speaking about talaq. And I think it's only befitting that we ask Allah to help us and we encourage one another, go home and make it work. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. So this is a beautiful verse. Divorce is twice. After that, فَإِمْسَاكُمْ بِمَعْرُوفٍ أَوْ تَسْرِيحٌ بِإِحْسَانٍ You either hold the woman with goodness and with that which is known or you release her in goodness. And this is why talaq has been made quite easy for the male because Allah wants to protect the female from physical abuse, from emotional abuse, from all forms of abuse. If a man was put in a corner and he was told you cannot divorce this woman, it's difficult. He might end up beating her up. He might end up perhaps may Allah safeguard us doing something that is not befitting a human being. Yet she is a human being. She is somebody's daughter. She is a responsible, honorable human being, a worshiper of Allah, a creature of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah says, you honor her. We make it easy so that when you are in that rage, perhaps instead of beating her up and instead of engaging in that which is unacceptable, you'd rather release her with goodness, with kindness, with beautiful words, send her back to her home. That in fact is a great act of worship. If you were to do it correctly, when it had to come. Then we have another verse that is also connected to one of the issues of divorce. And look at how, although it was revealed at the time of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it applies to us here and now. Subhanallah. I'm sure you've heard of cases where people hold back their wives and they do not release them thinking that you know what neither is this person going to be married to me they're not going to enjoy the bliss of the marital home they're not going to get their conjugal rights fulfilled and at the same time they won't be released so that they do not go to someone else i'm sure you've come across this there is a problem the marriage is broken but the man is not releasing the woman it happens so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes mention of this Obviously, the narration here is in the Muwatta of Imam Malik, and he makes mention of how there was a man who used to divorce the women, and then before the idda is over, he used to get them back. So he releases them with one talaq, and after a while, he waits for it to extend. When she's about to finish the idda, he says, Okay, I take you back. And after a while, he releases her again. And then when the idda is about to end, he takes her back again in order to prolong the time that she can actually now go and marry someone else. And Allah says very clearly, verse number 231, Don't hold them back in order to harm them out of spite. You know, people want to just fix others up. Watch out, Allah can fix you up too. Allahu Akbar. You want to fix someone, Allah can fix you. Remember that. If it is broken beyond repair and you've tried everything and you know that now there is no way forward, the best thing you could do, issue one talaq and release her in a way that perhaps sometimes in the future you may want to get back. You would still be able to get back because you have not issued the second or the third. But don't hold them back. Then another issue, something extremely interesting. If a man has had a problem with a woman and he divorces her. What happens? It makes the parents of the girl very angry. I'm sure you know that. It makes them upset because they thinking to themselves that you know what? 
I got my daughter married to you. I gave her to you. I honored you. I trusted you. I put her in your care. And here you are releasing her. She's released completely. You threw her back like toilet paper. Astaghfirullah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not make us from amongst those. And may Allah make our women folk such that this does not even happen in their lives. Remember, it takes two hands to clap, as they say. Sometimes one is hitting the other. You can still clap, mashallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us protection. But we need to cover our backs by saying, look, the problem is not just one party. Sometimes it's the other party as well. Sometimes we're equally guilty. So here, although we are speaking of how wrong the men can be, but sometimes the women need to look into their lives as well. Sometimes perhaps we need some rectification. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us rectify our bad habits. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness on our tongues and goodness in our entire system. Ameen. So there is a hadith of Ma'qil ibn Yasar radiya Allahu an in Sahih al-Bukhari. He says, I had a sister or my sister known as Jamila bint Yasar. We gave her in marriage to a certain Sahabi. He was a man. His name is mentioned in some narrations and in some it's not. We prefer not to make mention of it. So he says, you know what? He divorced her. And after he divorced her, guess what happened? Obviously, people were upset, you know, it happens. But, you know, we grow out of it very quickly. And the quicker you move on, the better it is for your paradise. Remember this. When a divorce has occurred, you're not the only person on earth who's been divorced. Perhaps more people are divorced than married. Do you know that? Which means the amount of people who have been married, who are sitting in their marriages, nowadays there is a new question that is asked. Before they would say, oh, mashallah, these people got married last year. Nowadays they say, hey, how long is this marriage going to last? You know that it's a reality because people don't know why they are marrying and don't get upset if divorce occurs. Sometimes it was the best way out. Sometimes it was the best thing that could have happened. You don't know, especially when there are children involved and they're watching you swearing, shouting, being physical against one another entire day and all night. They will grow up believing that's the norm and it will repeat itself when they get married. The best thing you could perhaps do is separate, go your own way. And perhaps you might have a spouse who will not do that. And your children will be brought up with one of the two according to what Allah has instructed in such a way that they would not have to see the swearing, the shouting and the bickering all their lives. So Ma'kil ibn Yasar says, after some time, this man somehow patched up with my sister and he wanted to marry her again. He gave her one talaq, everything was over. Now he wants to marry her again. And I said, no ways, not at all. I honored you. I gave you the sister of mine. I actually gave you some provision when you were getting married. You know, some people ask for all the gifts back. Do you know that? Well, those were not gifts then. They were just a bribe. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. If it was a real gift, you don't take it back. Trust me, you don't. It was a gift. You gave it to me. Come on. I could have sold it for all I care. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us be genuine and honest. So Ma'akil ibn Yasar says, Hey, I honored you. Then you just divorced her. And now you're coming to me, you have the audacity to tell me I want her back. <coughs> Allahu Akbar. Take a look at this. So she wanted to get married to the guy again. And he wanted to marry her as well. And Ma'akil is the brother being the obstacle. And he's saying, no ways. Already you were together. The problem happened. You think we are going to agree? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed verses, beautiful verses. Verse number 232 of Surah Al-Baqarah. Allah says, وَإِذَا طَلَّقْتُمُ النِّسَاءَ فَبَلَغْنَ أَجَلَهُنَّ فَلَا تَعْضُلُوهُنَّ أَنْ يَنْكِحْنَ أَزْوَاجَهُنْ إِذَا تَرَاضَوْ بَيْنَهُمْ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ When you have divorced the women and the idda is expired and over and the divorce is now proper. If they still want to get back to each other because the second or the third divorce was not issued, uh, then do not stop them from going back to those spouses of theirs, those ex-spouses of theirs. If both of them have agreed, don't stop them. When Ma'qil ibn Yasar heard this verse from Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, Al-ana af'alu ya Rasulullah. I immediately agree to this marriage, ya Rasulullah. Imagine how quickly they change their mind for revelation. A lot of us would not be able to do that. We have our pride. We have our, our own 
you know, loftiness. We have literally the word, the correct word is our pride. We are too proud to allow this to happen. What's going to happen to my name? My nose will be on the ground. Forget about you and your nose. Forget about your pride. Put your tail between your legs and say, if Allah's instruction is there, then it, it is my honor to follow the instruction of Allah. Subhanallah. Why can't we do this? Learn a lesson. Like I said earlier, these verses revealed so many hundreds of years ago. And today they are applicable. We are suffering exactly the same problems in our own societies and communities. There was a sahabi, Ma'qil ibn Yasar radiallahu an. Immediately, he says, I will do that now. And he happily got them married once again. And guess what? Nothing was ever mentioned in terms of problem thereafter. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all in our marriages. So that's as far as the issues of divorce have been made mention of in some of the verses I recited this evening. Now we go on to something very interesting. You see salah. When people are standing in salah and every little while a guy is scratching, what does he do to you standing next to them? Scratching. Scratching a little bit more. You get upset, you get angry. Please don't nudge the guy and tell him, <coughs> you know, because that's the wrong thing to do. My brothers and sisters, we would get irritated when someone is, when someone is, Fidgety in salah, please do not be fidgety. We are supposed to be standing correctly with silent obedience for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But imagine if someone came to you and said, Salaamu Alaikum. You know, I recall there was an uncle who used to look around and we were young, we were mischievous as well. He used to look around in salah, you know. And one day I said, hey, and he did this. And then he realized he's in salah and he quickly put, <coughs> he put his hand, his, his, his eyes down again. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. But some of us, that's how we operate in salah. We look all around, ooh, beautiful lights, lovely masjid, mashallah. Ooh, this is a nice, wow, it's echoing quite well, everything's okay. That's what our salahs boil down to. There was a time when the companions were allowed to speak in salah. Do you know that? There was a time when initially salah was prescribed, people were allowed to say certain things to each other in the salah. So they would whisper to the, to the person next to them, respectably for something. So then there came a verse of the Quran, verse number 238 of Surah Al-Baqarah. And this is a hadith muttafaq alayhi reported by Zayd ibn Arqam radiallahu an. He says, we used to speak to each other in salah. Until Allah revealed a verse, وَقُومُوا لِلَّهِ قَانِتِينَ Stand in prayer for the sake of Allah in silent obedience. Silence, obedient. When that verse was revealed, speaking became prohibited, fidgeting and everything else became totally prohibited. Amazing. There is a narration whereby they say one of the companions who was unaware of this appeared in Medina Munawwara during the time of Salah. And when he came in, he greeted some of the people, Assalamu Alaikum, and they were in Salah. They did not reply because the verse had already come down. And he says, what's wrong with you people? I'm greeting you and you're not replying. And then he realized there seems to be something. After the salah, they informed him of the revelation and the verse. My brothers and sisters, let us make it our business to stand in front of Allah with utmost humility, dead silence, and as far as possible, try not to fidget or to move. Look down and concentrate on the words, even if you don't understand the Arabic language. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all an understanding. Another very interesting story. When we give out sadaqah and we give out charity and zakat, sometimes we are guilty of doing the following. Okay? We are guilty of taking that which is not the best from our stock. Something that's not moving. They call it dead stock. No, that's zakat. I'll calculate that as zakat. But it's dead stock. No one wants it. Completely dead. But that's what we do. We say, but so what? It's valuable. It's got value. I'm going to count the cost price of it and I'm going to get it out. Zakat. Do you think Allah wants that dirt of yours? Astaghfirullah. Give it out as a charity besides zakat. Don't calculate it as compulsory charity. Calculate it as something for the sake of Allah. Okay, this is dead stock. People don't really want it. Let me give it away. Let me just give it away voluntarily. Someone might make use of it. But don't calculate it as zakat. Zakat is noble. It is great. Imagine you come for salah in the dirtiest of your clothes. That's not correct. You're supposed to come dressed appropriately with wudu. Perhaps put a bit of perfume. It's an act of worship to apply that perfume for the males as they enter the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
The same applies, you want to give zakah, give the decent wealth. It doesn't have to be the best, but it mustn't be the worst either. It must be the middle of that particular wealth. And perhaps you will achieve the pleasure of Allah. Very few would be able to release the best of their stock. Very few would be able to do that. So now, the Ansar, you know, they were known as Ashab al-Suffah. Some of the people, some of the Muhajireen and some of the poorer people in Medina Munawwara, they used to sit in a certain spot by the masjid and it was known as a suffa. So because they were poor, people used to come there and they used to hang some of the branches with dates and with fruit on it, on these branches. And some of the branches had beautiful, mashallah, dates and some of them had really lousy dates. Really, some of the bad stock, like I was mentioning moments ago. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes mention of this, the hadith in Sunan al-Tirmidhi, according to Bara ibn Azib radiallahu an. He says, this verse was revealed for us, the Ansar. He says, some of the men used to come and give good in terms of, they used to hang it there so that the poor could take. And some of them used to come with that which they themselves would not want to consume. So Allah says, Verse number 267. Do not make it a point to give the, the bad stock of yours, the bad wealth of yours. Yet you yourself, if you were offered exactly the same, you would not take it unless your eyes were closed. I wouldn't take that wealth myself and I want to give it to others. May Allah safeguard us. My brothers and sisters, you must be thinking, I give my old clothes away, I give my old stock away, my old stuff away. There's no harm in giving it to those who might make use of it. But let that just be something voluntary, totally voluntary. Something perhaps you might want to send to those who don't have it at all, who would appreciate it. But remember, generally, when you are calculating that which is compulsory, make sure it is not that dead stock. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us an understanding. Then there is the issue of love. Every time someone says, I love you, guess what they mean? <coughs> they mean different things depending on who they are. Some of them, they just mean I'm trying to draw your attention. That's it. So I say, I love you. And you don't even know what that means. Some of them, it's a way of saying, hello, that's it. I love you. And that, oh, okay, you do. And they think the automatic response is, I love you too. Have you heard that? May Allah protect us. What is true love? Once one of the companions came to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this is narrated by Al-Hasan in Tafsir al-Tabari. He says at the time of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Someone came to him and said, Wallahi, O Messenger, we love Allah so much. Wallahi, we love our Rabb. Okay? We love Allah. Who doesn't love Allah? We all love Allah. He made us. How can we not love Him? So verses were revealed. Verse number 31 of Surah Al Imran. قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهَ فَاتَّبِعُونِي يُحْبِبْكُمُ اللَّهِ وَيَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ ذُنُوبَكُمْ وَيَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ ذُنُوبَكُمْ وَاللَّهُ غَفُورٌ رَّحِيمٌ Say, if you claim to love Allah, if you really love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then follow me, Allah will love you. Follow me, which means follow the messenger of Allah. If you follow the instructions of Allah, it shows you love him. What's the point of saying, I love you, I love you, and then you do things against the same person or the same supreme being. I love Allah, but where is Salatul Fajr? I love Allah, where is my dress code? I love Allah, but I cannot give up adultery and gambling and pornography, but I love Allah. Do you know the excuse they use today? Don't judge my heart. Allah knows my heart. Allah knows your heart, but your actions are proving how distant you are from Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala, you yourself are making it difficult for people. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us all. May He help us improve, really. It requires dedication. You say you love Allah. You need to change your life in accordance to that 
which pleases Allah. And to know that, you have to go to the instruction of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, because he was the messenger who came to you. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all, and may he strengthen us. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, if you love Allah, follow me, follow Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allah will love you and he will forgive your sins. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease. One more point I'd like to make mention before we close for today. Something extremely interesting. The Jews and the Christians at the time had a debate. Nasara of Najran and the Jews of Medina. The, the, the Christians of Najran and the Jews of Medina, they were debating about Ibrahim alayhi salam. The Prophet Abraham, may peace be upon him. So the Jews said he was Jewish. And the Christians said, no, he was Christian. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed verses saying, hey, hey. How can you argue about Ibrahim, whether he was Jewish or Christian yet? He came well before Judaism or Christianity. If you take a look, he was the father of Moses. He was the father of Jesus. He came well before. So he was neither Jew nor was he Christian. Instead, he was a person who submitted to the one Lord, to Allah. The monotheism, it is known as Abrahamic monotheism. That was Abraham. Do not say he was a Jew or a Christian. Allah says it's common logic that he came well before. So what is this debate all about? Imagine how the problem was solved. Verse number 65 of Surah Al Imran, Allah says, Ya ahla al kitabi, O people of the book, Lima tuhajjuna fi Ibrahim. Why is it that you are arguing with one another about Ibrahim? Abraham, may peace be upon him. So, alayhi salatu wa salam. وَمَا أُنزِلَتِ التَّوْرَاتُ وَالْإِنْجِيلُ إِلَّا مِنْ بَعْدِهِ أَفَلَا تَعْقِلُونَ You are arguing about him yet the Torah and the Bible were only revealed well after him. Don't you have sense? Amazing verse. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us all and may he grant us all goodness. Allah says, مَا كَانَ إِبْرَاهِيمُ يَهُودِيًّا وَلَا نَصْرَانِيًّا وَلَكِنْ كَانَ حَنِيفًا مُسْلِمًا وَمَا كَانَ مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ Abraham, may peace be upon him, was neither Jewish nor Christian, but instead he was upon monotheism, submitting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and he was not a polytheist. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from polytheism. May he grant us the ability to understand what has been said this evening, to put it into implementation in our own lives. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all until we meet again for another episode. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad. Subhanallahi bihamdihi, subhanakallahumma bihamdik. Nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk.